All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Options Discovery. Today, we have Dan Passarelli here, author, options mentor, former floor trader. Um, can you please introduce yourself and uh, your background, how you got to where you are today? Yeah, I'm Dan Passarelli, and um, uh, thanks a lot, Alex, for having me. So um, I started out, I went to college in Chicago, uh, incidentally, the same place that you went. and. Um, I was a finance major actually, and I I was just always interested in finance. I didn't really know what I was going to do with it, but during college, I would I would walk to the to the Chicago Board of Trade, Chicago Board of Options Exchange, and back then the visitors galleries were were open to the public, and so I would I would actually go upstairs and I would just kind of watch and and it was always very fascinating to see the traders just doing what they were doing and trying to figure out what they were doing. And um, upon graduation, I, I thought, you know, I, I want to go try this out. I didn't really realize that I could actually be a trader, but I just wanted to go check it out. And so I printed up some resumes, knocked on every door of the Chicago Board of Trade building and got a job as a runner and and uh, the rest is history, as they say. Well, that's super interesting. And you've obviously come a long way since being a runner, being a floor trader, and now, you know, doing some work with your own firm. So you have uh, some, you, you've written a couple of books, you have your company, uh, Market Taker Mentoring, where you do a lot of options mentoring. Can you talk a little bit about those ventures as well? Yeah, yeah. So um, after being a, a trader, a market maker for a long time, mostly on the CBOE, I, um, uh, in a roundabout sort of way, well, first of all, I started working for the uh, for the exchange. I started working for the CBOE's Options Institute, teaching options, which is a job that I, I sort of reluctantly took at first. I thought, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I'll try it out and, and really found that that was my calling. And I, I really wanted to help regular people, right? It's like regular individual retail traders who, who aren't able to have that same experience of getting trained by a professional trader on the trading floor um, to sort of bring that to them. And so I started Market Taker Mentoring in 2008. Interesting year to start it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, we've become, uh, well, a lot of people would call us the global leader in options education. We have, we have, student traders in over 50 countries. Uh, we've trained thousands. I don't know. I've lost count how many um, people we've trained, but basically what we do is through, it's mostly online through one-on-one -on -one coaching or online group classes or some in-person events. We, we teach retail traders um, how to, how to become better traders and how to, you know, manage risk and make smarter trades and ultimately empower themselves with option trading. Yeah, I think that's super interesting because uh, obviously, you know, back in the day, from what I've heard, the, the best education was right being on the floor and options were not necessarily something that uh, the average retail investor had access to. But obviously with the digitization of the markets and everything being electronic now, uh, you know, anyone can can really start trading options. So that even 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 with that access, that education, uh, that floor education, you can't replace it. But if you can kind of give that to the retail traders from your own background, that's that's probably extremely helpful for them. Yeah, it's something and, you know, I don't mean to sound cliche or anything, but like it really is an honor and it's something special uh, just to be able to to kind of return the favor, I guess, to the option trader community. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. And we're super happy to have you on today. So uh, kind of getting into the the, the spirit of options education, uh, we've got uh, our topic for this week is intrinsic and extrinsic value of options, which is uh, a concept that uh, is something that is very uh, important for all options traders to really understand. All right. So in the spirit of options education, can you explain the concept of intrinsic value and why it's important to understand for options trading? Sure. Yeah, it's yeah, it's really important. Um, intrinsic means like real, actual, like at the heart of it. Right. And and that's where we get that term, even when it comes to option trading. So imagine that I own a, um, a 55 strike call which means it gives me the right to buy the stock at 55 
dollars a share on or before the expiration date. Now, if the stock is 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 above there, that's good. I own the right to buy it at, at a place below where the stock is actually trading. So I could I could exercise those calls, buying the stock at 55, and then immediately turn around and sell it at 60, wherever the stock is, and lock in that five dollars of, of profit. So that would be like a, like a real sort of unarguable value. Um, they we can also call that the in the money value uh, as well. But um, yeah, so that's that's one of the components of option pricing. Yeah, and I think that's interesting. So the intrinsic value is really how deep in the money an option is, whether it's a call or a put. So um, what would be the intrinsic value for an option that's out of a money, out of the money for our viewers to know? Right. So that would just simply be zero. So, you know, same example, the stock is at 60, but I own the right to buy the stock at 65. Then I, I wouldn't exercise my right to buy it at 65 if I can already buy it at 60. There would be no intrinsic reason for that. You know, there's no real like immediate arbitrage type value of that option. Yeah. And um, I guess as just taking the perspective of a retail trader. So I know now what intrinsic value is, but I'm looking at uh, the the options uh, to trade and I'm seeing that there are out of the money options that are still have some value. They still cost money. They still cost a premium. And I guess that kind of leads us into the other type of value for an option, which is extrinsic value. Can you give us a brief introduction to what that is? Yeah, so that is where options really get interesting, um, because I think a lot of people think of options as, you know, simply a substitute for the stock. Hey, if I think the stock's going up, instead of buying the stock, I can I can buy the calls and I can get more leverage. But there's so much more to that, that right in and of itself has a value because it can potentially be worth something. And so, um, you know, like, would I ever, like, if you think about it, like, would, if the stock's at 60, would I ever consider buying the right to buy the stock at 65? Uh, first, to a layperson, it might not make any sense. Like, no, why would I do that? But if I can pay just a little bit for that, and if the stock, for example, is fairly volatile, or if there's a real lot of time until expiration, that call can be worth an immense amount of money, right? Like if the stock goes to a hundred or something over the next year, right? So, so like it's that right that we're trading and that's where the extrinsic value, the value outside of just the very simple, here's where the stock is, here's where the call is. Um, and, and that brings into like, like a lot of other, other pricing factors besides just the stock versus the strike price. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it seems like extrinsic value is not determined by just one factor, but by a variety of different factors. Can you kind of go into the different components uh, that really de decide that extrinsic value of option? Sure. Um, for many, many years, I would say there are three main factors, but now there's four. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll finish up with the, with the, the uh, new old one uh, or old new one. I'm not sure which way that goes. So I guess back to the same example here, um, the stock's at 60, buying the right to buy it at 65. Okay, you know, it only has to move five bucks. There's a couple of considerations there. First of all, how valuable, or excuse me, how volatile is the stock, right? If the stock barely moves, it hasn't seen $65 in $65 or uh, $55 in three years, you know, it's a boring stock probably wouldn't want to buy that call. It, it probably will never have intrinsic value. So, but if the stock is very, very volatile, you know, it was a hundred yesterday and 50 the day before, it has a much better chance of having some value. So, so the amount of volatility in a stock will affect the value of that right. Uh, the amount of time that I have that right for is valuable too. If it's expiration day and the end of the day is going to be in five minutes, um, that right might not have a lot of value if we're still five bucks away from it. But if the call doesn't expire for a year, well, then it's much, much, much more likely 
that the stock can can move up from 60 to 65. So there's more value the more time there is. Um, also, if the stock's at 60 and we're talking about the 200 strike call, man, the stock has to move a lot more. It's so much less likely that the stock can get up to 200. And so because of that, the, well, I guess we talked about three things now, right? Volatility, time, and the stock's price relative to the strike price, how close it is, which we might call moneyness. And uh, for, for many, many years, we were in a basically a zero interest rate environment, but now we're not. And the interest rate also affects the value of options because if you think about it, if if I could buy a call as a proxy for buying the stock, right? A uh, hundred shares of a sixty dollars stock would be what six thousand dollars, I guess, right? But maybe I could buy the call for for two bucks, just two hundred dollars. Well, I could leave the rest of that money, the the fifty eight hundred bucks, in the bank and earn interest on it. So that affects the value of the call in and of itself, right? Because the call ends up having a little bit more value, the higher interest rates are. And I'm using calls in all of our examples here. Uh, we can make the same case for puts in, in all of these different examples, but, uh, you know, just sort of keeping it simple. Yeah, no, that that's great. And I think um, it's, it's interesting to see how these different components interact and see um, how those kind of determine that value of an option, like even for an in the money option, right? You're going to have that intrinsic value, which uh, is going to be reflected in the premiums, right? But then there's still going to be a little bit more on top of that. And that's where the intrinsic value comes into play. So when it comes to measuring these different components, what tools or, or what models do traders use to measure these and, and use it for more practical applications when it comes to trading? Yeah, I mean, to me, the most important thing, well, one of the most important things that a, that a trader can use, like the, the best tools in the toolbox are what we call the option Greeks. And the option Greeks measure the effect on option prices of the how much the stock price moves relative to the strike, uh, time passing, the amount of volatility, and even the effect of changes in the interest rate. Because it's very it's very important to understand how each of these affects the option. Because if you think about it, when you're trading an option, any option, even something as simple as buying a call or something very complicated uh, with multi legs, you're always really trading all, all four of these things. You know, you're trading, there's always the directional component where you'll make or lose money, a time component, a volatility component, and an interest rate component, whether you want them or not. So the more, the more, uh, access to that information, the more you look at the Greeks, the more control you have over your, your, your own positions, the more you can understand them, the more you can craft better ones, the more you can plan better exits and uh, even entries. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And I know the Greeks are something that's very important for the options traders to understand. And uh, when it comes to one of the factors, which is what we're kind of talking about is uh, time value of an option today, which uh, is represented by one of the Greeks, I believe. Um, can you explain a little bit more about when people talk about options as a decaying asset? What, is that, what does that mean and, and how is that measured? Yeah, so as time passes, options become worth less. It's sort of the same logic, but just in reverse of what I was talking about before. You know, the more time there is, intuitively, the more value the option has because they the potential of being worth more. So as time passes, there's less time for something to happen. So there's less value. And so traders who, who trade options in whatever capacity, like really needs to understand how fast that those options become worth less, how fast that time decay happens. And we measure that with the Greek theta. All right. So it, theta, if, if, if I'm an option buyer, right, I'm the person who's buying that call because I think the stock's going up. Well, I know if the call is going to lose 25 cents of option premium a day, it's got to go up enough uh, as measured by Delta in order for me to make on average 25 cents of premium a day, like really, really important stuff here. 
Um, it, it guides my entire strategy selection. And some people will choose to capitalize on selling op- on selling options because they decay and they're putting that little extra factor in their advantage. And, you know, they want to see if it's worth it. Do I make enough in a one day period or is my profit so low relative to the risk that it's not worth it? Um, and another thing to consider here, too, is uh, if you think about it, it'll be intuitive after I say it, but it might not be yet. The intrinsic value, that's simple, straightforward math. It's this. It's the in the money value, stock price minus strike price. So there, there is no time decay on that because as time passes intuitively, in hindsight, intuitively, yeah. um, <laughs> right? Uh, in hindsight, intuitively, um, that wouldn't be worth less uh, as time passes. So it's only the time value part of it. And that really kind of helps us kind of separate things in our minds better and sort of, um, you know, crap better strategies, like I said, and, and, and think about what I'm trading in which component of it. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And it's something that is really important to understand how these different factors kind of come into play. One thing that I guess would be my question would be, obviously you have this time value that's decaying. How do you separate that from other things that could be increasing? Let's say volatility starts to increase. So you see that intrinsic value start to rise, but at the same time, that time decay is a factor. How do you isolate those different uh, factors in extrinsic value? Yeah, I mean, if you just sort of start thinking about it from a lay perspective, it can just be mind blowing, like, oh, my goodness, how do I keep up with all this stuff? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, like it all sort of ends up coming out in the end, like the option premium changes and and a lot of newer option traders, like they won't look at the Greeks. They'll just look at how the option premium changes and they'll they'll have all these questions. It's like this mystery, like. Like I I bought these calls and the stock went up, but my call is down and I just don't understand. So, so breaking them down and and looking at those components is a game changer. So knowing that, you know, there are these four main factors, but truth be told, you know, row or the effect of interest is still a very small factor, even, even now. So we really only need to to focus on and think about delta, which is the stock moving, theta, which I just talked about, measures the time decay, and then vega, which measures volatility, which is probably a little bit of a longer discussion. But whenever I'm making a trade in the, what we call the option chain on my retail trading platform, I, I have columns for each of those. I have a column for delta. I have a column for theta. And I have a column for Vega. And so when I'm doing my forecasting, if it's a directional trade, I'll look and I'll say, okay, well, how far do I think that this might go? Okay, well, that means my delta would give me this much profit. How long do I think that move will take? Because that matters a lot, right? Um, Oh, I think it'll take two weeks. Well, then those calls will lose value by that amount. How much do I think volatility will change? I'll factor that in. And so, I mean, it can feel a little bit intimidating at, you know, at first to watch these three things, but it's only three things. You, you sort of get in the habit of it and you look at them and 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 think of every single option trade as, as kind of like trading a basket. You're, you're trading these three different things. And uh, boy, I guess that's probably a lot easier than an arbitrage or trading, um, you know, 500 stocks against the S&P 500. They've got a lot more things to think about than three. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. And and there's a lot of platforms obviously that can, that break that down for you, but it, it's the idea and the framework to kind of synthesize that information to, to set up your trades. That's, that's really what the important part is. So I want to get into a little bit about your background. So obviously now you focus a lot on, well, a lot of different things. You're an author, you're an options mentor um, and I can see the guitar behind you as well. <laughs> Musician as well. Add that to the, the list of things. So um, I wanted to focus on that options education component just because that's kind of what we're all about here. Um, what initially attracted you to becoming an options mentor from being a, a floor trader? You know, I I was always just kind of had an interest in it. Um, you know, I remember one day like just talking with, um, you know, 
my father wasn't in trading or anything like that. We were just kind of talking about something. And it's like, oh, there, there's uh, different currencies in different countries. And um, it's like, okay, you know, it's fine. I'm like 11 or something. And uh, he's like, well, you know, yeah, in order to get British pounds, you would have to pay this many dollars. But, you know, a month from now, you might have to pay a different number of dollars. And I just sort of remember sort of connecting some dots there a little bit and thinking, well, if I can buy them for fewer dollars now and sell them for more dollars later, you can make money doing that. Uh, and I don't know, I guess my mind always sort of worked that way. And um, that's kind of what got me interested in, in, in finance. And I, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with that degree, like I mentioned before. But then once I got down onto the trading floor, just because, you know, uh, taking finance classes, you talk about exchanges and that kind of thing. And the proximity of being so close to the exchange was, you know, gave me a, something to pique my interest. And so I, I think once I got down onto the trading floor and really started to connect more dots and, and understand how it all worked and, and then realized that there were people out there called backers who would just give money to someone to trade and split the profits and you didn't have to um, come from some, you know, royalty or something to uh, end up being gifted a, a seat to the exchange or something like that. Like anybody could do it. It's, it's, it's a true meritocracy and, and it excited me and it made me really want to work hard to try and get that opportunity. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. But uh, when you were starting off, in the options industry, um, who were some of your mentors and, and what was some good advice that they gave you early on in your career? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I started out as a clerk, um, which is basically where everybody starts. And I was pretty fortunate to have a number of mentors. Um, you know, uh, there, there's a, a phone clerk that, uh, sat at the desk desk next to mine, who was a pretty young guy. And, I just bugged him with questions and he didn't seem to mind being bothered. Um, but then finally I started working for uh, a guy named Gino and I, I was his, his assistant and I had to know his trades as well as he did uh, because if there was anything wrong with it, I, I mean, I, I had to alert him, you know, um, and he kind of grew his team a little bit and there were some other folks. So I, I had to really watch all these things and I had to really have it under my thumb because if I was wrong, it could cost them tens of thousands of dollars, right? So, you know, in, in that regard, it was a little bit of trial by fire. Uh, <laughs> um, once I got into um, teaching, I sort of had a different set of mentors. Uh, when I was teaching for the CBOE's Options Institute, uh, there's a guy out there, kind of a legend, uh, Jim Bittman, who uh, didn't teach me about options. I'd already been a professional by then, um, but he sort of taught me how to teach options, which is a different skill altogether. Um, and so, yeah, I, I sort of owe to him um, just my, I, I guess, my success with um, my communication skills uh, and being able to communicate these things effectively because options are fairly complicated and it's really important to break them down into very, very, a very, very simple way to look at things. Yeah. Yeah. It's very important. I, I, I can imagine uh, back trading on the floor that communication was probably the, the lifeline for, for any trader to, to really have those good communication skills and to be able to communicate fast. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, down on the trading floor, for sure, as a trader, communicating fast was so important. But, you know, I mean, it's important to our students, too. Like, I mean, uh, our, you can you can try and figure out trading on your own, um, reading a couple books and watching some YouTube videos, but it'll take you years. Like, people come to us to shorten that learning curve. And, you know, it's, that's my job. That's my responsibility. And I take it seriously. And so I want to make trading as easy for our student traders as possible. Yeah. And that's a great way to look at it. And I've also seen that you've kind of taken a lot of what you've done in the options mentoring world and you've helped, you know, 
start education process in, in other countries as well. Uh, just wanted to highlight some of your work in Asia and in China in specific. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, options markets look like in foreign countries and how that mentorship goes when, you, when you're kind of going outside of the scope of the U.S.? Yeah, I uh, was uh, a little bit serendipitous, really, but um, I ended up being really, really fortunate to be sort of part of, well, to have a very small part in the launch of options in China. Um, the the Chinese culture is very uh, deliberate, right? Um, they tend to study something very, very thoroughly before, you know, committing and 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 starting, right? So several years ago, maybe 2013 or something like that, I was invited by a colleague of a colleague to come and, and teach class in Chicago to some folks from China, from some of the exchanges and brokerage firms. And it was then that I, that I even learned that they were considering starting an options market. And, you know, they, they were trying to educate some of the their best and brightest, you know, the exchanges were in the brokerage firms were. And I just found that really, really interesting. And uh, the more I, I talked to some of the folks that I was teaching, uh, some of them invited me to come to China. And, and I had the opportunity to speak at the Shanghai uh, Futures Exchange um, uh, in, in Beijing. I spoke, I don't know, I, I, I think I've had maybe 12 or something different um, classes that I held there, like three-day classes that I held. Uh, as well as doing some consulting for some of the exchanges uh, right before they launched um, the Dalian exchange, right before they launched, I believe is their uh, corn meal contract, brought me in just for some like final questions that they had. And it was just really, really fascinating. Uh, I feel really, really fortunate to have gotten that opportunity and, and been part of, you know, been part of that launch. Um, I think it's very interesting and uh, that, you know, other other markets kind of moving into the, the option space, obviously, um, even even the names of of, of options of, of that, that we've commonly hear, right, American options and, and European options, um, just just intuitively that, you know, it's been it's been a, a very big market in the West. And, and to see that kind of expand across the world is really interesting and in that you've been at the forefront of that. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, just the, the different paths that you recommend um, for a beginner to start learning about options. And um, I guess to kind of conclude that question, what are the programs that you recommend that people uh, reach out to at Market Taker Mentoring as well um, in terms of, you know, if, if I'm a beginner and I, and I want to learn about options and, and learn about all this trading stuff, what is the, what is the best path for me? <laughs> um <clears throat> You know, it's funny. Just yesterday, I was talking with um, with Bobby, who's um, on our marketing team over here, and we're going to be doing stuff on um, radio. Basically, uh, I'll save the long story. Um, and and we were thinking, well, you know, we could do this and we could try that. And I was like, hold on a sec, wait, wait, stop. This is the exact thing that I talk about with our student traders. There's already someone who has done this before and knows how to do this. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Let's find that person and ask him. <laughs> and if there's a place out there, we'll take the course. You know, uh, if it's 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, 5,000 to, to get that information so that I don't have to make all those costly mistakes financially time-wise and have something that should take a week, take six months. Um, I'd so rather do that. And, and, and that, that's hard for a lot of people to wrap their head around until, until you end up either getting into the education from the teaching side of it, or just taking enough education. And, and I am on both sides of that, you know, just this idea of somebody else already knows how to do this. Why would I try and figure it out and piece together these puzzles with a blindfold on instead of just have somebody tell me how to do it. Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan of that. Um, not because I'm in education, but I'm in education because I'm a big fan of that. Yeah. So I think that's an interesting perspective to take and, and that um, kind of leads into 
the opportunities that people can approach at Market Taker Mentoring. So what kind of students do you accept uh, at Market Taker? Do you need some sort of experience? Can it, can it really be anyone that wants to trade these uh, listed options can take your course and, and kind of learn from the ground up? What, what uh, types of students do you teach? You know, I think options, like the concept of the existence of options is such a misunderstood and underestimated cultural phenomenon like listed options really like level the playing field between professional traders and just the average Joe who you know, wants to learn how to protect her portfolio um, or trade with the leverage of professional trader. Like they both use the same instruments for the same thing, equal access to it. So if it's up to me, I, I would love to be able to, to, provide education for for everyone like it's an incredible amazing tool you know so we we do like to work with beginners because um well they haven't tried to figure it out on their own and developed a bunch of bad habits um but <laughs> i think most people that end up finding their way to us do have some level of experience uh you know if you're watching this and um and you are new you know please, by all means, come on in. The water's fine. We welcome you with open arms. Um, but a lot of people do end up having some level of experience. And um, I think that's because, you know, we have a very experienced uh, instructional team here. And, and we're one of the few education firms, I think, that really can take people to that that top level. Um, there are a good number of some of the student traders that we trained went on to become professional traders. And um, I, I don't think there's a lot of um, options education firms out there that can say that. Yeah, I, I think that that is, I mean, to the, to the, to the extreme of options education, that that's, that's, that's a big achievement to have someone come in uh, that's, that's kind of new to trading options and to, to become a professional trader. Um, so with that being said, uh, I appreciate you shedding that insight. Let's move on to some of the closing questions for the interview. So one of the first questions that we ask every guest that's on the show is what is maybe some of the most important lessons or lesson that you've learned while working in the derivative industry, either the easy way or the hard way, or maybe a better way to phrase this is what advice would you want to pass on to somebody that's looking to get into this business? Oh, man. Um <clears throat> I have learned a million lessons from uh, from great successes to terrible failures and everything in between. Um, and and I still learn those lessons. And you know what? I think that that is really important. I'm a lifelong learner, and um, I'm never gonna tell you that uh, you know, oh, I'm done learning. I know everything there is to know about options or trading or anything like that. And and that's the really cool thing about being in the financial markets is that it's always changing. Um, you know, the instruments stay the same, um, but you, you know, the ways they're traded changes, you know, just market structure has changed amazingly over the last 15 years even the way stocks uh, IPO with SPACs over the past several years. Um, we've got daily options in SPX and such. Um, the market is always changing and, and it keeps you on your toes. And, um, you know, I remember when I was, when I was young looking at uh, people who are, well, my age now and thinking, you know, like, boy, they don't really know anything about what's going on in the world. And, I can't have that luxury of not knowing what's going on in the world. You know, if you're trading, you know, the, the market and trying to understand the economy and stocks, like you have to be up on things. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's just a very exciting thing to be a part of. And, um, and yeah, that, that's one of the things I love about it. And uh, I guess this was about lessons. I, I, I guess the main lesson is, you know, be curious and continue to be curious always. Yeah, that's that's great. And I think it really lends itself to the point of, you know, you got to keep your your finger on the pulse of things, especially when you're trading and especially as, you know, uh, trading has become, uh, you know, more of a 
a, a competitive and, and fast paced environment. It's already, it's always been to some extent, but now maybe more than ever. Um, so one thing to kind of close out the show is we every week do a different topic. This week, you helped us out with intrinsic and extrinsic value of options. Is there a topic you think that we should cover in the future or in a future episode with another guest? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, boy, I could think of a whole bunch. Um, <laughs> one that's one that's a little bit on my mind here for whatever reason is um, liquidity might be a fun thing to explore if you haven't already. Um, you know, just the, the, the nature of how the market works and where prices come from and, you know, just how, why it's easier to, to trade in some stocks than others has a lot to do with, um, you know, just with that single thing called liquidity and eh, th that, that might be interesting. Yeah. Well, it sounds like an interesting topic. That's something we haven't covered before. So uh, thanks. Thanks for, thanks for the tip. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Dan. Really appreciate you showing your insight and, and helping us out with this week's topic. Um, where can people find you? Where can people find your work? I've seen you kind of all over the uh, options internet as it will be. Um, but what were some, where's some places where people can uh, reach out to you? Yeah, Alex, if you uh, if your folks want to find me directly, you can make your way on over to markettaker.com. That's market as in stock market, taker as in take what is rightfully yours, two T's in a row, markettaker.com. And you can actually go to the uh, to the top right of the screen and click join free and, and you can join our community free. Um, we have, especially for new folks, we've got some great classes and resources there uh, at for a, um, for a limited period of time, you can actually join our, our chat room and participate in the community there and get some great trade ideas. So yeah, we'd love to have you and help any way we can. All right. Well, I appreciate it, Dan. Thanks for coming on the show and hopefully we can speak to you in the future. All right. Thanks for having me, Alex. Talk to you. Talk to you. Bye. If you're hungry for more options content, make sure to subscribe to the JLN YouTube channel and check out our social media accounts. Be sure to check out our website, johnlothiannews.com, MarketsWiki, and the John Lothian newsletter for more content.